it's around the right time, I'm just going to go for it. Okay, um, so last time we talked about force control. I tried to give a couple uh, examples about how sometimes it's more natural to, to program using the language of forces in your controllers instead of using the languages of positions. But we mostly assumed that the, uh, that the robot was a point, right? And so I promised that today we'd go through and add the rest of the robot back in, and that is exactly what we'll do. Uh, <coughs> There is, you know, it's a part of a bigger discussion about manipulator control. Uh, I'll, I'll mention again at the end, but there are aspects of manipulator control that might have you focus on executing trajectories at high speeds, very, um, uh, you know, very high, with very high accuracy, possibly with uncertain payloads. Okay, but we're going to talk about the force control aspects of manipulator control primarily today. Um, <clears throat> so I'll take you through a couple steps, but I want to call out that. Uh, at the end, we'll have a, a, you know, Rachel actually does, uh, does work on this regularly with her Franca robots, so, so she's going to show you some of her case studies uh, at the end, which will be an extra treat. Okay, so just to, to set it up and re remember, there, there are tasks like this one, for instance. I, I gave a couple different examples last time where, um, you know, really the task requires uh, thinking about something about forces, right? You're, you're trying to apply um, the right amount of force to uh, maintain frictional contact between the hand and the book, and then um, between the book and the table. It needs, you know, needs to be you need to be in that sweet spot where the book's still able to slide on the table, but the hand isn't sliding on the book. That extra part is that actually this is a pretty good uh, example. The the video wasn't actually meant to show force control. It was meant to show this cleverness at the end, which even though there was some uncertainty, having driven the book to the end. If you choose the right kinematic strategies at the end, you can reduce all the uncertainty by just pushing to the end and then, um, and then grabbing the book. Okay, but that's a good example, I think, of something you'd like to do with force control, you know, writing on the board, erasing the board, um, picking up the really big flat Cheez-It box. These are all good examples, I think. Okay, this is the one we we spent time on last time was just actually trying to reason about what forces you should apply at the finger in order to stay in the friction cone on the end. And this was a, you know, a strong um, uh, regulator sort of on the forces you would apply at your finger in order to not slide. Okay, so let's add the, the robot back in. And I'm gonna do it mostly, uh, of course, we wanna apply this on the KUKA, but I actually think for the board and for all the concepts, it's totally fine for me to do everything with a double pendulum for today, okay? And then I mean, we're gonna use the, the general form of the double pendulum, but anytime we wanna get into the details, I'll just choose um, you know, two angles instead of seven to work with. And I'm gonna spend a little bit more time on this part of the board today. It's, I realized I was always showing the, my backside to the camera. Uh, so I'm, let's see if this works. If you guys don't like that, you should tell me, um, but let me try. Okay. Um, Let's spend our time today mostly thinking about a double pendulum, okay? I actually um, will often call this the simple double pendulum when I use point masses for the dynamics, but uh, we're gonna stay mostly in the, the, the general form today. All right, so a lot of times when I draw the pendulum, I'll think of it as, as coming down from the top as a hanging pendulum. If you're a KUKA, maybe you're bolted on the bottom, no big deal, okay. So importantly, I'm going to parameterize the pendulum, you know, the double pendulum with just the two angles, okay? I'm going to put my end effector here, which I'll, um, I'll call the kinematics of this. I'll have some point. We'll potentially call it the, the contact point if that's the places where we want to make contact, okay? We've got gravity coming down, of course. I'm going to allow motors in both of these places, so I'll have a torque here, torque here. <coughs> masses distributed and the like, okay? Um, so this fits right into the same equations we've been using for the big complicated EWA, right? It's, it's got the standard manipulator equation form. Okay, plus potentially any contact forces, which we'll add later. And in particular, it's nice because Q here is just theta one and theta two, super easy. And 
um, u here is just tau 1, tau 2. Okay, and the equations are, um, are derived in, in the, the notes, well, the linked notes, but uh, you know, if you care, it just comes up, especially if you um, just do lumped masses, then the terms come out particularly easy and we could write them on the board, I won't, but you know, th they look like that. Okay, so <clears throat> um, what we want to do here is, is figure out what torques to apply to achieve some sort of force control or program the interaction you know, uh, here at the contact point. That's the goal that we're trying to, to achieve. And there's a really core idea that, that I want to start with, which is this idea of sort of feedback canceling control. So um, given the system as written, if I have U as an input, so I can apply torques at both of those joints, and if I know m, c, and tau g, the gravity forces, then I can write a controller that sort of changes the dynamics, the effective dynamics of the robot, uh, almost at will, okay? I, at some point, maybe I'll have torque limits or other problems, but let's just think about how I can already change the dynamics of this to pretty much anything I want, right? So as an example that I actually use uh, typically in underactuated to talk about how this approach is limiting if in the more general sense, but it's actually very useful here. Um, what if you had a goal of just replacing the dynamics of your two-link pendulum and making it, make it act like a one-link pendulum? Or, I mean, you can't, there's only two degrees of freedom, so you can't make it act like a four-link pendulum, but you can, you know, you can sort of impose whatever two-link dynamics you'd like, okay? What would that look like? The, the equations of the, sim the single pendulum are even simpler, right? Maybe I have, this would be equivalent to saying I'd like the accelerations of my two-link pendulum, just V for desired, right? Let's say I'd like the first link to just swing around as if the whole thing was just a, a one-link pendulum. So maybe this gives me something like negative G over L sine theta, you know, maybe with some damping. Okay, that would make this first thing act like as if it was just a, that it had the dynamics of a single pendulum. So if nothing else, it would be canceling any effects that are coming from theta two moving around so that theta one moves like a sing simple pendulum. And there's a, there's a handful of things you could write here. Let me just sort of cartoon it. Let's just say I want the dynamic acceleration of that to be zero, right? In practice, if it doesn't start straight, maybe I would put a little feedback control to make it go straight. But in general, I want to basically make this, you know, pretend that it's not there and not move. And I'll just make the whole thing sort of swing like a single pendulum. Okay, so that's just a different desired acceleration for this, it's not the one that naturally happens with the physics of the double pendulum. But, you know, as you can see sort of algebraically, if I were to just choose to apply a controller which goes in and exactly cancels out the terms in my equations of motion, and then for this one, I do, I'm a little bit more clever. I'll do this. Then if I were to run this as a controller, okay, this is my control. This one which looks very similar is my plant, is my, plant my equations of motion. If I put them together into the closed loop dynamics, 
then, then C cancels, tau cancels, and I get MQ double dot equals MQ double dot desired. And because we know, I mean, I, um, the world knows, I, we haven't spent time on it in this class, but we, the world knows that mass is always positive. Um, even in the mass matrix form, mass matrices are always um, positive definite or semi-definite, depending on the system. So, but the, um, in general, we, we're gonna say in these cases, it's safe to do uh, M inverse, that exists. which implies that I get Q double dot equals Q double dot desired. Okay, so this kind of works and I have a, a simple example of that in a notebook. Um, I can take my original dynamics of the pendulum and if I run that, right, this is just the, if U equals zero, what happens with the double pendulum? It just falls down with respect to gravity, right? And if I write a simple controller that just does um, almost exactly what I just said, that I, <coughs> and I write that in a simple you know, leaf system here and, and put it in feedback with my plant, and I wait for the first one to finish running. Okay. I was just saying that somehow all of my computers feel slow today. I don't know what is happening here. There we go. All right, okay, so the double pendulum with that simple controller suddenly just acts exactly like a single pendulum, okay? And it's, I mean, that doesn't seem too surprising or whatever. I can also just, I mean, I, I don't even have to respect gravity, right? I could just do the same thing but make gravity be the negative of the true gravity. And I could run that controller too, and it's, I just have a, a new system that because I've just overwritten the dynamics completely, that new system can be whatever I want. I can do it act like I'm a, you know, um, a pendulum in space or what, a pendulum upside down or whatever, right? So this is, um, you know, powerful idea, which is if you write the right controller and you have enough control authority, then you can basically overwrite the dynamics of your system. Okay, <clears throat> now, you know, what can go wrong with that? Yeah, please. Okay, so, the, so he says it's, it's, uh, it seems very dependent on your ability to estimate the torques. I mean, it also means estimating the masses accurately, right? Estimating the Coriolis terms accurately, the, the gravitational terms, absolutely. So that's, that's great. Um, I mean, people do things like this in practice, and it's interesting to sort of run the sensitivity analysis. There's ways to sort of see how sensitive are you to your mass matrix estimate and, and the like. Um, but to an extent, I mean, uh, this works, right? So it works in the case of a known robot arm. Let's be super clear, actually, that if I were to write the dynamics of a full manipulation problem, where the, ma the equations of motion included both the robot and the world, the manipulator, and the manipulate, and the manipuland. You guys know the word, I don't know if I've used the word manipuland a lot, but. That's what people often call the thing you're manipulating. It's kind of, a, I mean, it's actually props to Steffi if she's out there, you know, she, she made me laugh about how ridiculous this is. It sounds like a, a place where everybody's happy and manipulating, right? But, um, but that's the word people use, right? Um, you know, that's the object. Okay, if you had equations, what would happen if you had equations that included, you know, both the masses of the robot and the masses of the manipulant, right? Well, I can't write this form anymore because I don't have torque applied directly to the, to the objects, right? I only have the seven actuators on my robot uh, and I don't have actuators directly affecting. So I can't directly overwrite the dynamics of the objects in the world, right? this B matrix becomes low rank, right? And so that's kind of, that's why this is a lecture in underactuated because the whole, you know, this system is underactuated if you consider the, the robot and the world, and that's kind of what the other 
a class I teach on robotics, and it's called underactivated robotics. It's all about that. Okay, so that's definitely a limitation. Um, but of course, like you said, these are also limitations. You have to estimate this. And also, if you ask your your um, you know your system to to follow some dynamics that just requires ridiculous amounts of torque, and you have torque limits, you know, there's there's lots of things that could poten potentially interfere with this. But locally, you know, or within reason, if you want to change your dynamics a bit, then it's an incredibly practical, powerful idea. Okay. And it's kind of it's gonna you know. It's gonna, this philosophy is gonna underlie what we're gonna do. And we're gonna, you know, basically the goal is at make my big complicated robot act like it's a point robot at the end. And I can apply forces at the end, or I can apply, I can act, program the interaction at the end. Okay, so let's, um, <coughs> let's generalize that idea or implement you know, a version of that idea that is, um, going to you know act like a stiffness controller. So if I want to program the interactions, but I'll start by just programming them at the joint level. So instead of acting having my double pendulum act like a simple pe pendulum, I'll act make it act like a system that when I push it has some desired mechanical response, right? So there's a, there's, a, there's a bunch of different controllers we could have written here. Um, you know, we talked even in lecture two about the differences in torque control and position control. If I were to write a position controller um, you know, for this, I might write a PD control, right? Something like this Q. That's one controller I could write. The philosophy in stiffness control, though, is not to, to have somehow a, just a rigid position, but to actually program the response. If I were to, um, you know, I want my pendulum to act not like a simple pendulum, but like a different mechanical system, which has a, a particular response to torque perturbations, right? So I'd like to act like it's a, you know, a pendulum that's hanging down that has some springs, some rotary springs here that have a certain stiffness, right? Maybe an, and maybe some damping. So I'd like, like it to act a system like this. This is the interaction that I would like. I would like it to be that if my pendulum is sitting there and I were to go up and push on it, now the push in this case um, you know, is written in the, the, co the, the coordinates of this equation is in torques, but you can imagine coming in and just have, giving a torque perturbation, or if I had a force that I pushed on the end, I could, I could transform that into the torque, co torque coordinates, okay? But if there's a perturbation in torque, whether it's because someone actually pushed on me or the robot's moving and it didn't realize it ran into the dishwasher or whatever it is, Right? Then I'd like it to respond gracefully as if it was a mass spring damper system. Right? This is almost, this is just the generalization of like the mx double dot equals kx uh, you know, plus bx dot equals f. This would be the simple mass spring damper. That you get from 1803. This is just the joint version of that. Okay, so using the same philosophy from the feedback cancellation, whatever is back here, right? I can write this controller by canceling out the dynamics of the plant that I don't like and inserting the dynamics I do like, right? Just like the pendulum example. 
So the controller I write here is very simple. It's going to look not so different than before. I'll just choose u to cancel out tau g. Okay. I'm going to leave, see, I, I, I have this, this term I don't have to cancel out. I've left that alone for now. Okay, we'll talk about that. Um, and then I'll just add in my This looks almost identical to the PD controller I, I, I did, you know, we put as our straw here. But it has one extra term, right? It's got the PD control. I made this point last time too, right? Plus some gravity compensation. Right? Same thing I said for the point finger. And in practice, for uh, when the EWA is doing this, it's actually doing much more than just gravity compensation. Did I get something wrong? Yeah. Yes, good, thank you. Yep, I keep, I, had to, I have to flip it. When I put it on this side and I want to think of it as a stiffness, I, I get it like this, and when it's on this side, I have to do this. Thank you for catching that. There was a high probability I was going to get at least one of those signs wrong today. There's so many of them that would look similar. Okay. Um, <clears throat> on Iwa, they're doing gravity compensation, but they're also doing you know, friction compensation and some you know, pretty subtle stuff in, at the actuator level to try to make, to basically cancel out the effective dynamics of the, of the arm and replace it with this you know, uh, stiffness kind of interaction when you run the Iwa in s joint stiffness control or joint impedance control. I'll, we'll say that in a second. Okay, now, um, again, so what's the big difference in practice between add, you know, having this versus having this? Right, it can make a huge difference in practice because um, if you think about even the double pendulum, if I need to choose a stiffness that allows me to work sort of when I'm at a horizontal position where I've got gravity pulling down and this term could be large. If I wanna have a small position error here, I need to choose KP very big in the, in the PD controller, okay? If I can, and you know, here KP could, it would be excessive down here to have that kind of KP that I would need here just to get a reasonable. So if you want reasonable for performance all over the state space, with the PD controller, you have to choose KP very large. KB very large to damp that out, okay? If I subtract out gravity, then I can write a smaller KP that works, you know, has a similar response all over the workspace. That makes a big difference in practice. It means you can choose these much lower and you can be much more responsive, right? So in practice, when people are running these controllers, you know, you bump into the robot and it's just like, um, you know, maybe it's a fault and powers down, right? If you do it like this, then the EWA, the way we typically operate it, will just kind of, you know, be soft enough to get out of the way. Okay. We chose our desired, um, Dynamics to, to use the initial mass and core, you know, so, so you should think of these things as always going together. This one is just like the, the MA in F equals MA, right? Um, those two really go together, okay? And we chose not to change them. You can write, you can imagine the same kind of trick where you go through and you try to cancel out M and C, okay? But it typically requires um, uh, high bandwidth to achieve well, good accuracy of, of your mass, that would take you into a joint impedance control mode. And sometimes this stiffness control, you might call it a, a, the simple impedance control. I think impedance control is the more general term, it often gets used for the whole, um, the whole set of concepts, okay? Um, EWA, actually, you, you know, when you go into their settings, it's like you're definitely choosing joint impedance mode, right? And they are doing some amount of 
mass cancellation, but actually they're only compensating for the masses of the rotors and not for the whole robot. And it's actually a very subtle, um, you know, I think well thought out, carefully designed control that does exactly this kind of thing. So they are technically changing this a little bit, but, but not in the way of like um, making a different effective mass. Does that make sense? It's really a lot like the feedback cancelization, cancelization, uh, cancellation story, okay? Um, but it's trying to do a little bit less and it's even more robust because of it. I had thought about possibly spending some time talking uh, in more detail about the EWA implementation. Uh, I decided if, you know, if most of you are not using EWA all your life or you know, care more about RL agents in simulation or whatever it is, maybe that that's not, the, you know, I shouldn't dig into too much to those details. But I will recommend that the papers are, are totally uh, fantastic. Um, you know, strongly recommend the papers which are linked in the notes. Um, by, by Albu Schaefer and Christian Ott about, uh, about the elastic control of elastic joint robots. Let's say impedance control. Um, Alessandro De Luca has some great notes too if you're interested. Mark Spong had some of the early work of it. There's a lot, there's a really good literature there that I was tempted to talk about, but decided not to. Okay, so let me remind you uh, a point I made early when I was just telling you the, the virtues of EWA, you know, is the fact that we, we do have that kind of um, capability and we exploit it often. So in, in the pieces of the, you know, dish task, like for instance, opening that door, right? So the, the joint trajectory that it is programmed to, to follow during that opening motion is actually you know, deviating probably significantly depending on how accurately we modeled and, and actually you know, uh, ca captured the, the location of the dishwasher and even the hinge of the dishwasher. You can imagine that if you're trying to move down exactly some kinematic constraint given by the door of the dishwasher, if you're a little bit off, then it pays a lot to be a flexible enough to just follow whatever contour is given by the actual position of the dishwasher and not by your you know, course approximation. Right, you can see that over and over again. We have, <coughs> for the EWAs upstairs, we have a little IKEA cabinet that you can open and you'll see the same thing. If you spend any time trying to open those IKEA cabinet doors, your fingers will typically slip right off if you're in too stiff of a mode and you have to, to, to get soft. Similarly, when you push down here, Right, so it's still in a joint impedance um, mode there, and it's not tracking the position trajectory super accurately, but it's accomplishing the task. Cool, does that make sense? All right, now the interesting part here is how we go from this basic, I guess that's just that thing. So how do we take this idea now and implement it at the end effector? Right? So instead of affecting the dynamics in Q, we want to write the dynamics at, at the end effector. So I want to go up and I want to push on the fingertip of the, of the EWA and have it act like a mass spring damper system in 3D or, or uh, whatever, okay? So So this is sometimes called Cartesian stiffness control, end effector stiffness control. Okay, so how do you take those basic equations and, um, and impose a dynamics in the end effector? Now, um, 
we have the end position of the, um, of the arm given by some kinematic function of Q. So this is the relationship we get to work with, right? And I would like to impose something like, you know, MP C double dot plus B C dot. Um, tell me if I get the sign wrong. Equals, you know, some. Right. This is my goal is to achieve something like this. The interesting thing is that the way that, um, you know, if I were to try to rewrite the original Q coordinates uh, in this form, I have to somehow change between Q and P, okay? It turns out you can take those initial equations. If you, it's, I think it's very easy in the derivation to, to um, end up at a dead end, but I promise you that if the, the, the proper change of coordinates that gets you through is you, you have to write your end effector mass This is the, the Jacobian here, okay? I use the Jacobian times the mass inverse of the original system, Jacobian transpose, and take the inverse of this whole thing, and that's my, um, my new effective mass, okay? This is the, it's not surprising that you're gonna use the Jacobian to change coordinates, Okay, what's maybe a little surprising is that you can write the equations of motion in the end effector frame as a function of the original coordinates and the Jacobian. Okay. So I can get a new set of equations with an altered um, mass matrix, an altered um, Coriolis matrix, which still depends on Q and Q dot, okay? An altered torque matrix, I called it this in the notes, okay, plus my u in the new coordinates, plus my uh, external forces. This transformation is often called, you know, operation space form. the dynamics. It's super useful, okay? Yes? I was just about to ask you that. It's not really fair. If you ask me before I ask you, then do I still get to ask you, right? I'm gonna ask you. Is, this, is it obvious that this matrix is invertible? What are the conditions that would require that that matrix be invertible? In general, you'd expect this to exist. This would be like the right inverse of A if A has full row rank. Okay, so let's first ask, does the, does the Jacobian have full row rank? Okay, you can certainly find singular configurations where it doesn't. But in all in the reasonable parts of the workspace, you know, J tends to be, for instance, could be like three by NQ, for instance, if I'm trying to do end effector, right? It's, it tends to be uh, full row rank and low column rank because it's a long, um, short matrix, okay? So this, is, this has every reason to, to, to work and then M, M is actually also positive definite, so this thing's gonna be well conditioned too, so this thing, yes, will we'll have an inverse, as long as J doesn't go singular. Okay, which is as it should be. Like, there, um, if you just try to start jamming J transpose into your original equations of motion, you'll, like I said, you'll, you'll find yourself stuck, but I think um, uh, it must be the case that if I were to push on the end effector of a physical uh, contraption, it will, uh, push back on me with some, you know, physical uh, force. 
that force that it, it, it pushes back on is configuration dependent. Okay, there's some big complicated set of mass. It, I'll have more or less of it working against me at each axis depending on the configuration of that, um, of that mass. Okay, but this, is the, this was the magic step we need. Now we can do, um, if we start working in this, um, the new, the dynamics in the operation space or the end effector space, okay, then we can just do feedback cancellation in this lower space. <laughs> I think there, okay, yes? So, so we had a good question about this, um, even when I was talking about singularities, like what is your ability to produce force at this, uh, you know, at this end point? The controller can't produce force in that direction instantaneously, but the, it can produce a force dot. It's kind of the, right? So you have to be careful if you start writing these controllers in those singular configurations and you t tend to either do the kind of things we talked about with writing it in a, uh, in a constrained least squares and put some boundaries on it or something like that. Yeah, but I think, um, you know, try not to do that or be careful about it. There's something else that's happening here too, right? So if I write a controller that tells me to act like a certain dynamics in the XYZ configuration, but let's say I have seven degrees of freedom of my robot, then you still gotta do something else. The same way in our, um, in our Jacobian based controller, we talked about putting a secondary objective in the null space, right? Something for instance, just stay in a comfortable joint configuration you need to do something like this to stabilize the null space of, the, of, of this controller too, right? So, such that this basically almost equals this, right? plus null space stabilization. Okay, so that has some implications. The fact that we tend to not try to change M and C, and the fact that it is configuration dependent means that instantaneously you can act, you can make your robot ask, act like a mass spring damper system. The mass that it acts like, though, will be configuration dependent, right? Almost always. So in, in the quasi-static analysis case, if the accelerations are small, then you're gonna, and you're just trying to push and see it, how far does it deflect before it stops, right? Or before you hit a new steady state, the mass doesn't matter there, right? The inertial terms don't matter in the static analysis. But in the dynamic analysis, if you start trying to understand the dynamics of your robot, then it is going to, you know, be notable. Maybe not hugely important. Like I said, it, it would be it would be beautiful and clean to make them somehow constant a function of Q, but we tend to not do that. And there's theoretical limits on what you can, how much you can change the mass to before you write a controller that is unstable. And Neville has some great surveys on on, on that. Neville Hogan um, has some great surveys on on that kind of thing. Okay, so if you remember. Uh, I, maybe I didn't show all of them before, but um, you know, this is end effector impedance control. And again, it's only barely impedance control. It's really more of a stiffness control, I'd say. And watch, um, first of all, he's very happy, so it must be good. And second of all, he's gonna, they're gonna change the compliance, the effective compliance, okay? And he's gonna show you that um, you know, by changing the, the compliance there, now it's a very low compliance a small force is allowing a big perturbation. Again, the stiffness of that will not change as a function of the, orient the position of the end effector, but the ma effective mass will, okay? There's no reason why you have to choose the same stiffness as in, in all three axes, right? Uh, you can choose them differently, and that's gonna be important. Uh, 
the end of the lecture, I think. Oh, that's really fun to watch, okay. Um, <coughs> you can also write stiffness in orientation. So I think this one is, is showing, yeah, you can set a rotational compliance too, right? Um, if you're now trying to control the whole you know, parameterized in terms of roll bit jaw or, or however you parameterize the end effector stiffness, uh, you can similarly command an end effector stiffness on this. Make it very soft in rotation, very stiff in translation. Pretty beautiful. Okay, one more point, a small point um, or detail to call out here. When you go to implement this controller, um, one of the things you need is you actually need to insert somehow um, the acceleration. You need P double dot of C, right? This is just kind of an aside here, but we said P of C is F is kinematics of Q, we know P dot of C is, takes this form, it's a Jacobian, okay? You end up needing P double dot of C too in the derivation. And it comes up in a lot of derivations, so I just wanna call it out here. Um, <clears throat> so what is P double dot of C? We wanna take one more time derivative of this equation. Okay, so using the chain rule, I can write it as J C Q Q double dot plus J dot C Q Q dot. And there's a question that we get like every couple of months on Stack Overflow. Okay, they're like, oh, how do you produce, how do you get, you know, J dot in Drake? All right, sorry, that's the you know, specific version of the question, right? But um, this comes up often. And the answer is, you don't, or you, you could, but you really don't want that. You probably don't want that. And this is just a little window into a lot of um, smart thinking that happens in the manipulator equations about how to optimize, um, optimize different workflows, okay? But J of Q is a matrix, right, is a, I'll just even say matrix, I don't even care about its size right now. Um, J dot of Q is gonna be um, partial J, partial Q. I mean, I have to be careful how I write this, right? Q, um, Q dot, but that's a tensor somehow if I'm not careful, right? So this thing is gonna be a sum over I, maybe the simplest way for me to write this, partial J, partial Q I, Q I dot, right? Just take element by element gradient of this. You don't want, you definitely don't want to compute this. You can compute it with auto diff if you want, okay? But we're not gonna make that easy for you because you almost never want that, right? Because J dot, Q dot is a vector. And pretty much Every time you ever want J dot anywhere in any of your controllers, <laughs> you actually want J dot Q dot. Okay, so in practice when people say, oh, where's, you know, where's J dot? Uh, you don't want J dot, you want J dot Q dot, there's a function for that, okay? <laughs> um, and you'll see that over and over. You can, you can compute that fast, it doesn't have to allocate a lot of memory, you know, it's got this nice recursive form, okay? That's, that's the term you always want. And it's gonna, it becomes essential in implementing this controller. Loads of details in there, but. Everything good so far? Yeah. Okay, so one last um, idea I wanna land before I let Rachel have the stage here. So uh, is, if I've done stiffness control and end effector coordinates. I could have also done force control in the end effector coordinates, okay? Um, and, it's, and it's really pretty easy to do if you make that same quasi-static assumption that we did last time.
Okay. The recipe is use the operation space form. A recipe would be to say, um, assume that Q double dot approximately, you know, take the quasi static assumption like we did last time. Choose your controller to cancel the terms such that um, you know F C desired equals F C in the end effector coordinates. The equations would look almost the same as what I just wrote. But do you remember what happened when I was doing the pure force version of the cheese it box flip up, right? It did this sort of beautiful force control. Um, it stayed inside the friction cone. It got to the top of the box and sort of by all accounts was done. And then the finger went, you know, like kind of shot off into nonsense, right? Um, that's real, <laughs> right? Uh, if, you, if you're only commanding force and you, uh, you know, you have no other specification of the objective. If there's not a world to push back on you and the force you expect, then you can sort of, you, you can go away pretty fast, okay? What, so people, I think it's relatively rare to do pure force control in all six degrees of freedom. It is, um, there is a thing that people do do often, which is hybrid force plus um, either position or stiffness control. Okay, so if I have my two link arm here out in the world and I've got my P contact, and let's say there's a chalkboard over here that I'm trying to write on, okay. or push the book, the way we pushed the book there was, was very similar to this, then it's very common to do force control in this direction. And stiffness control in this direction. That's sort of a natural specification of the task. Right, the, the natural way for me to specify my objective on the board is that I'd like to be pushing into the board with some amount of force. Regulating that force is the primal, you know, uh, the most natural way for me to specify the, the goal of having white lines appear on the board, right? Stiffness, of course, or somehow reasoning about the position is what gets the, you know, the job done in the other axis, right? So this is a very standard setup to do hybrid force and position control. And there's no reason in the equations why you can't set the dynamics in one axis to be you know, a, a force command and the other axis to be a stiffness command. This can have very nice properties. If you're trying to do the wall following kind of behavior, you know, it'll, do, it, it'll do these. The, um, the only challenge, I guess, is that um, uh, you, know, if you're, you have to estimate the coordinate frame well. Right? If you are a little bit off on your estimation, then you could be applying forces, um, you know, or, or applying, just acting like a little bit of a stiffness into the board and you can confuse things a lot. So it's a little bit dependent on the uh, accuracy of your coordinate estimation if the gains are very different in this axis versus this axis. But that's a strategy people use. I think Rachel will give you an example of where it may work or may, may not work as well. Um, you know, you could also alternatively act like a stiffness into the board too, right? And the example that we just showed of the Iwa acting like a very different stiffness in the x direction as in the y direction could be, extreme, could be exactly what you'd like here. In this case, then, maybe the goal would be to put a, a set point of my spring at some virtual wall just behind it, have a carefully chosen stiffness in this axis and a different stiffness in this axis, and that can get the job done, too. And there are, you know, differences in the way those, are, those get implemented that, that can make a big difference in practice.
okay? But this notion of hybrid force position control is an is a important sort of piece of that. Okay, so <clears throat> I just want to um, mention what I think are the, the beautiful thing about this is this idea that I can really, you know, make my dynamics at my finger act like whatever I want within reason. The problem I have with all this, and I think maybe the biggest limitation in my mind, is that you, you're only talking about the dynamics at your finger, right? So in the case in the world where you have an Iwa with this beautiful point that wants to stay perfectly there and you know, I'm gonna push on the point, right? That's all good. If you're like reaching into a toy box, right, and making contact all over the place, then the, if this doesn't give you a recipe yet. There's something else that's missing, right? There's something, somehow you either need to estimate the locations of contact, which is hard, by the way. There's good papers on that, but it's not easy. And typical, typically, the sensors that you have, in, joint sensors are impoverished for, the, for that estimation problem, okay? You might need a tactile skin, right? Um, and even if you did, if you have multiple points of contact, you somehow would need to somehow program the behavior of interaction at multiple points simultaneously or whatever, right? So how do you program uh, a more gen general form of interaction? Okay, so that's one big limitation. Um, there's another sort of silly, annoying limitation, which is that if you want to change the location of that end effector, or even change from joint stiffness to end effector stiffness on the EWA, you have to stop the robot, turn off the control software, change the, the mode, and then power it back up, okay? And I totally see why that makes sense, because they don't want to like worry, reason about, I mean, they work so hard to guarantee the passivity properties and safety, specify, you know, safety steps, or whatever. And if someone starts like flipping between controllers at, you know, uh, in software, I can see that being like something you don't want to support. But it's kind of annoying, and, um, and it means that, that in general, you know, we are operating primarily in the joint stiffness mode in, in the work I've shown you. I think Rachel will show you some that, that uses the end effector modes, right? Um, but there are sort of problems, I think, that, that go along with that, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so good, so, so the question is why not work in torque control mode? So you can send a feed forward torque, even with the stiffness controller, often you can say I want, I want to act like KP plus KD plus some feed forward torque. Uh, it's typically, you know, just sending torques puts an onus on you modeling the dynamics well enough to cancel the gravity compensation out and everything like this. You're gonna run your controller over some impoverished interface at a lower bandwidth than what's running on the, the robot. So it really pays to like let, them, let the EWA stack or the Franca stack or whichever stack do as much of the cancellation at super high rates with super well calibrated gains uh, for you. So, so we tend to do, so the, actually the way the book worked is we were in a stiffness control, joint stiffness mode, which we tend to, tend to use. And then we added an additional feed forward force on top of that joint stiffness controller in order to push into the, to the book, okay? So that's a good, it's a good question, but for implementation reasons, you know, you, we tend to not, I mean, if I was, if we were working at KUKA, maybe we'd go all the way to torque level, you know, but, but as a user of a commercial robot arm, you, you just can't. So um, the transition here, let me just, um, you know, call out. So there's actually a, a fun project at, um, at TRI uh, trying to build, um, it's not Baymax, it's Puno. Punyo means like um, chubby and lovable and a little silly you know, in, in Japanese. Um, this is actually the, the Toyota THR robot, which is awesome if you haven't seen it. Um, and that's Baymax from Disney. And uh, we're, so we're slowly building uh, Punyo, yeah? So uh, this kind of makes the point though, I mean, there's, we'll, show, we'll talk more about the tactile sensing later. There's some really nice tactile sensors and soft bubble grippers there that are all open source, but, but um, you know, the goal of this project is to make contact all over the robot. So um, this is just a kind of a fun video that uh, they had the robot grab a fish tank because you could put a camera in the fish tank. Um, people were a little worried about it dropping the fish tank, so that everybody's just checking, you know, but uh, it's super fun. So, yeah, so that impedance control, as I've written on the board today, doesn't offer strategies for programming the interactions like that. Right, because the location of the contact is sort of not specified a priori, right? 
So there's a different mode of operation, which I honestly, I think we have to get to, is, is just a more general make contact all over the system, you know, instrument contact, tactile sensors all over the robot um, that are constantly measuring forces and pressures and everything. So that's just a, a fun project uh, going on. Um, cool. Okay, let me turn it over to Rachel, who's going to tell you about her work. What do you need here? Oh, my piece of gray. Okay. Oh, yes. This is the first time you're all seeing the bottom of my face, uh, which is fun. I do have the bottom of my face. Um, Okay, so we've been talking about uh, control over the last two days, and what I basically want to do for the rest of the course is we're going to talk through a case study. I'm going to introduce you to a new robot and a new task. It is not um, with a dishwasher. And we're going to walk through basically what are the control options that you could do, and then it's going to be specifically, uh, because this is based off work that I've done, what are the control choices that I made? Um, so even more so than usual, this is not like objectively the correct answer. This is the choices that we made, and I will walk you through why we decided to make them. Um, so we've been working so far with Kuga, right? This is the robot we've been dealing with. I'm going to introduce you to a new robot, which is uh, the closest robot to the Iwa while technically being a different robot, which is the Franca Amica Panda. Um, Franca Amica is the name of the company. Panda is the name of the robot. They have a very cute story about why they call it a panda. Um, these robots are incredibly similar. They are both seven DOF. They are made by the same people. It is DLR, um, the German Space Agency. Um, the differences are that the, the Frank Amica is uh, newer, it is significantly cheaper, um, and it has better documentation. Uh, I think Russ's joke is that if you want to know how something works in the KUKA, you just go read the Panda documentation uh, because they are exceptionally similar. Um, cool. So, So this is the robot that we're dealing with. Sorry, I forgot to grab my notes. Um, one really neat thing about this robot is that on the underlying system, you can send either joint positions, joint velocities, or joint torques. Like that is the underlying controller interface. Um, and the really nice thing about that is that allows you to build on top of it a wide range of controllers. So you can build uh, in joint space position, velocity, impedance, torque and in Cartesian space, uh, position, velocity, impedance, force, hybrid, anything you want. Um, to kind of echo the point we made on Tuesday that uh, these controllers are not so, so different is that you can implement joint position control either by sending positions at the lowest level or by sending torques at the lowest level. You can do position control either way. Um, one difference between the KUKA and the Panda is that if you want to switch control modes or if you want to switch stiffnesses for the Panda, you do not have to turn off the robot and reboot. You can just willy-nilly switch the controllers, uh, which is really nice and something we're going to take advantage of. OK, so this is our robot. It has lots of different control modes. That's cool. Let's meet our new task. Um, the task we are going to consider which I will draw out, but I also brought a prop, is that let's say we have a child-proof medicine bottle where you have to exert a push twist. You have to push down and twist in order to open it. Are people vaguely, like all of you have this in your medicine cabinet? Um, for me, like, it is nice that you, we could get a robot to open a medicine bottle. Like That's something I'd like my robot butler to do. Uh, but the broader point is like it's a very nice example of a system where you want to both exert uh, force and position uh, in order to accomplish this task. So to write this out, if we want the robot 
to open this bottle, it has to both exert a force downward on the lid while twisting it, which you could think of either as twisting it or exerting a torque. Are we clear on the robot that we're using and the task that we're achieving? Cool, okay. So let's walk through the different ways that we could approach this task. Uh, we're gonna walk through basically three different control strategies. Option one. Now, I'm asking what control strategy could we use given that we wanna exert forces and not being creative at all, what's the first thing that comes to mind? Yes. So right, we've talked about force control. You could do force control to implement this task. Like you could run a force controller. Uh, you may guess by the fact that this is option one and I told you there are three that we are not going to go with this. There are two main reasons. One, force control scares me. Um, force control can be pretty dangerous. Um, Russ mentioned, you know, uh, force control is great if you are in contact and kind of to illustrate that, you know, if I have, this is the Frank Anika Panda, this is one specifically in Alberto's lab, and I, if I ask it to just exert force down while it's in contact, it doesn't care where that block is, it's just going to keep exerting force down. Right, it's, it's somewhat robust because it doesn't care about position, it's just trying to exert force down. Um, and actually, we'll switch it back that if you ask it to exert no force, uh, then to, to echo the point, it's actually gonna run gravity comp. That here, I'm not asking to exert anything down, but it'll stay in place because it's doing gravity compensation. Cool, force control is well-defined if you are actually in contact. Um, but if you are not in contact and you ask a force control to exert force, you're kind of in an ill-defined state. So it's going, if you ask it to exert force and it's not in contact, it's going to do its best to exert force, uh, which means it's just going to whip back at you. Uh, fun fact, I did this by accident the first time uh, and it nearly cracked the back wall into Songbei's lab, sorry Songbei. Um, <laughs> and was like very terrified, I was like, oh God, I, I have to, you know, uh, it's because I, I put something in the wrong sign, uh, and I was like, oh God, I have to fix that, I did it again, and my nervousness did not recompile, did it a second time, uh, and then the third time I was like, I should record it. Um, <laughs> so that's what you're seeing here. This is kind of a, a, a toy example of where force control can be dangerous, um, because hopefully you will not be so dumb as to, as to make a sign error, um, but in general, you have to ensure that you are in contact and force control is not well-defined if you're not in contact. So that's one thing that makes me nervous about force control. Um, the second reason that we did not go with force control is you could argue here our goal is to exert a torque, um, but specifying it as a torque um, could be kind of tricky and it arguably is not maybe the most intuitive way. And so for that, our second option that we could have taken Looking at what we just covered, uh, if I now want to do a force and a position, well, before that, force and position, we're just going to talk about uh, hybrid position force control. One note is like, as, as Russ mentioned, some people will call it hybrid position force control, some people call it hybrid force position control, some people call it hybrid velocity force control, they are all effectively the same thing, you just can't call it hybrid control because that's another thing entirely. So if you do hybrid position force control. Now again, I told you there are three options, so you may guess uh, that we didn't go with option two either. Uh, why? Uh, hybrid position force control is arguably would be a great choice for this problem because it's very easy to specify we want to exert force in one direction and we want to exert, uh, we want to control motion in another position. Uh, additionally, my advisor is the dude who advised the person who invented hybrid position force control, so it would have been a very natural choice. Um, why did we not do it? Um, so it actually comes back to this point Russ made, um, which is that, I'm sorry, I'm moving a ton, which is what we tell Russ not to do. Um, <laughs> okay. um, 
In order to do high repetition force control, you know, you are specifying in what directions do I want to exert force and what directions do I want to control motion. And you define those constraints with respect to a frame and you turn it with a lot of beautiful math and you specify it using Fathian constraints. Um, but it relies on being able to estimate that frame very accurately. And as Russ mentioned, if you get that frame wrong, you're going to be exerting forces in the wrong directions, which gets us to the same case of like force control being scary. Um, so one is that, uh, Hybrid position force control is beautiful. I love the math. It is difficult to get it right in a system. That's reason one. The second reason is you might not actually need it for this task. So hybrid position force control works well um, and is definitely needed if you're in the case where you care very carefully about regulating force. So the classic example, right, is if you want to be writing or you're doing welding or you're doing grinding or sanding where you really carefully care about regulating what force you are exerting. Us less so. Uh, we are in the case where we want to control how much force we are exerting and we want to be able to exert enough force basically to open the bottle, um, but we are less concerned with regulating like it has to be exactly this force or we've messed up welding a part that goes on a plane. Um, so hyperposition force control, powerful, hard to get right in some cases, maybe not needed for our task. And so because of all of that, we opted, and again, this is what we opted to do in our research. You could definitely do this with hybrid position force control, and that would be an equally valid choice. Uh, also, if my board work becomes either too small or ugly, someone please call me out on it. So what we opted to do is use Cartesian impedance mode. Um, to Russ's point that he made on Tuesday, people use stiffness control and impedance control fairly interchangeably. Um, and in this case, it would be more accurate to say that we're using stiffness control. I'm going to call it impedance control. Um, also, as Russ pointed out, uh, some people say Cartesian, some people say indefector, some people say operation space because that matches Osama Kati's uh, seminal paper. Uh, some people say task space. All of those words technically have like slightly different meaning, but we're going to use them interchangeably here. Good so far? OK. So I want to open a bottle using Cartesian impedance control. How am I going to do that? Which Russ somewhat uh, stole my punchline, so that's OK. So let's say that we have a ground, and we have our uh, R indefector. And we're, we're dealing in Cartesian impedance space. So we have a spring. Um, this is a symbol for uh, a damper, uh, if that's unfamiliar to anyone. OK. Um, so we specify uh, a stiffness and a damping um, and a set point. Uh, technically, because we are in Cartesian impedance control, um, in our full glory, our stiffness matrix is a six by six. So is our damping matrix. And our set point is in SE3. Everyone good with that notation? Okay. So how do we, given a mass spring damper system, exert force? For right now, I'm just going to focus on the fact that we want to exert force down. We'll get back to that twist part later. How do I exert force down? Russ already mentioned this. If you basically move your set point further into the ground by, let's say, some d, this is going to cause your spring to compress decision. Um, again, this is a decision we made. Doesn't mean it's objectively the correct thing, it's just the choice we made. Because um, if I think about what stiffness and what damping do I have to specify, that's a lot of numbers. Uh, those are big matrices and like more than I want to deal with. Um, so what we're going to do is instead of specifying the entire matrix, we're going to actually only consider the diagonal. So what is our stiffness in X, in Y, in Z, in Oh, I'm not going to remember the order correct. Roll, pitch, yaw. Instead of 36 numbers, now I have six. 
Um, and rather than controlling the damping matrix, I'm just going to set it to be critically damped. Uh, if that does not mean anything to you, that is okay. It's basically a way of setting it such that we minimize oscillations. Uh, so that is To tie back to a point that was made on Tuesday, you know, I've seen a lot of people who do work now on uh, learning impedance parameters. Um, and there's an interesting thought of like, you can learn everything, um, or if you make these simplifying assumptions, it's a lot smaller thing to learn, um, which obviously would make your learning problem easier. And so there's a thing to think of like, how much do you actually need? Sometimes you will need the off diagonal terms. So this is not a decision you can make unilaterally. Um, but it's just something to think about what assumptions can you make about what you actually need to give your controller. Cool. Okay. So we have our stiffness and our damping matrix. Uh, we have a lot less to specify. Let's think about what stiffness do we want to exert in the z direction and what is this uh, offset d? If we want to, what do I need my spring stiffness to be and my offset to be if I want to exert force down? Now, we have told you that we are getting the robot to act like a mass spring damper. Uh, and you might reasonably say, OK, it acts like a mass spring damper, but like, is it actually? Um, and uh, shockingly, with some back of the envelope calculations, again, these were done kind of ad hoc, so don't, don't take them as for granted, is that um, the relationship between your offset in your, your D, your offset, uh, into the ground uh, and the stiffness of your spring and the force that you exert is linear. Like, how far I'm exerting, the, for, uh, the force that I'm exerting. And so it behaves exactly like a spring, to the fact where if you say, for a given stiffness, I want to exert this force, I can pretty closely tell you this is the D that exerts that. Um, and we actually did this across multiple stiffnesses. And the fact that like the robot behaves so amazingly well uh, is honestly both suspicious and like a credit to the engineering that like it actually behaves like a mass spring damper. No one is suspicious of this. Okay, you all believe me. This yeah, R equals one for that last one, which like, I mean, it's not the densest point. But uh, when we say it acts like a mass spring damper, at least for the panda, it actually does an excellent job of acting like a mass spring damper. So this is to say that if I want to exert a certain downward force, I can pick a certain stiffness in my work, I have a heuristic for which stiffness, effectively, I want to be uh, as stiff as possible. Um, and that can directly tell me what D that I need to exert. Does everyone follow on that? This is how we can use Cartesian impedance to exert a downward force, because we have a super well-behaved mass spring damper. So you said the Cartesian control algorithm cannot go down until Yes, you are asking it to do a thing that it cannot. It gets very frustrated and exerts force at you, which is what you want. Cool. Michelle, really, sorry. If it, so here I can be like very confident that I can exert a force. Um, if this was less well behaved, then you would not be able to as directly control your force. And that gets back to the point, like if we needed to control an exact force, you shouldn't be using Cartesian impedance mode, you should probably be using hybrid. And then we go repeat the question. Oh, sorry. Um, the question was, what if this wasn't so well behaved? Okay, this covers, you know, what is my offset D and what is my stiffness in Z. We've right now only covered the pushing down part. Uh, what about the twist? Um, so for the twist, what we basically need to do is we need to generate uh, set points at this D offset, uh, which move in a circle. And luckily, all of you have done this because this is what was asked in the robot painter example. And I, I wish I could claim this was like all planned, but it just like works out very nicely. Um, None of you look happy at the fact that you had to do that. Um, <laughs> um, so to review, um, what do we have to send our controller? Um, we're going to set our stiffness and our offset D based on how much force we want to exert. And then we're going to generate a series of set points that basically trace out a circle, uh, choosing pretty high stiffnesses in the other dimensions uh, with our damping set to be critically damped. Questions so far? Okay, so that is essentially what we're gonna ask our controller to do. Um, that is not actually the complete picture. 
So let's say that we have our robot here. This is the same panda from before. Um, and what we're actually going to do in order to, in my work I call this a push twist, um, is that we're not exclusively going to run a Cartesian impedance controller. We're going to leverage the fact that we can switch between controllers. So the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to actually do what's called a garden move. Um, it's a move until touch. It moves until it feels contact with something, which allows us to be kind of invariant to what the exact position is in D. Once it moves until touch, it's going to compute those set points based off what that actual distance is. Um, it's going to go around and twist. Uh, I, I don't run my robots very fast, to be fair. Um, and then once it's finished, it's going to do what I call a move out of touch. And so it's actually three controllers that run as part of this. Move until touch, Cartesian impedance to actually twist it, and then move out of touch. Yeah? Why, why switch controllers? What's the, why does the whole point of switching controllers is turning off the digital one? Why not just use the one that you meant to do and move on that one? You could, do, you could just run this with Cartesian impedance control direct down. Um, yeah, it's an equally valid choice. I think it, uh, the practical answer is I have move until touch implemented uh, using position control instead of uh, Cartesian impedance control. And so that's just what I call. Uh, but there's no, there's no good reason for that. Yeah. Oh, I did not repeat the question. Why don't I do uh, move until touch with Cartesian impedance control? Because it's springy. Yeah. Um, yeah, so the particular implementation, sorry, the question is why does it look like it's not moving continuously? Um, and that's because the implementation that we're running there is that we are actually sending a series of set points and it's checking um, that you hit each set point before moving to the next one. Um, there's an interesting implement, okay. I consider it an interesting implementation detail about how dense do you want those set points. Um, for us, we make them somewhat dense because particularly for this robot with the impedance controller, it does not like doing large motions in impedance mode. It, it can be uh, pretty dangerous and actually fault sometimes. Yeah? Why is it not like doing big motions in impedance control? So the question is, why does it not like doing big motions in impedance control? Part of that is due to the gains that it's set, which you could change. Um, the other question, the reason why I pause is because uh, I can answer this question with a lot of personal bias, um, which is that uh, doing large motions, running uh, Cartesian control, I would argue, is, uh, can be somewhat dangerous for the instance of you, you are not collision checking. Um, if you are moving in an empty world, uh, which is what a lot of people do when they run uh, Cartesian control and they're not collision checking, then it's fine. But it's not terribly general because you're not uh, collision checking against the world and checking things. Um, or often checking a lot of other things like that. So it is not like it for the gains perspective. I do not like it um, because it's not general and safe. Hope that answers. Okay. There is actually, uh, and due to time, we won't get into it, uh, there's a couple interesting points about, um, uh, right, this is a redundant manipulator, and so there are design decisions about like what is the starting configuration before you run that controller, and picking that such that you are, uh, can control things within the null space uh, and do not run into a singularity. And so we do some heuristics and checks to make sure that um, that initial configuration uh, allows you to do that, that smooth motion pretty well. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, so I've showed you for one case, uh, to, to zoom out a little bit, um, with this work, we actually implemented that same controller, but four different ways where the thing that changed is what is the contact that you are making. Um, and all of these controllers, um, were defined as basically actions that you could do that you could either open the bottle by using your palm, by using a grasp, uh, by using a finger, by using a tool, all of these have different kinematic properties as well as frictional properties. Um, and uh, so these were different actions that you could take. Um, we're not going to talk about this yet, um, but basically we defined those actions in combination with a lot of other actions. Um, and we used a task and motion planning system. This is something that I think was mentioned four lectures ago. In the decision-making lecture, we mentioned that task and motion planning is a powerful tool. Um, basically, using that to sequence our set of controllers, uh, 
we can find, we can search through basically a combinatorial search space of different ways to solve this problem. Um, so for the interest of today, um, right, this is running different Cartesian impedance controllers as well as position controllers in order to accomplish this task. Um, if we uh, do a task in motion planning kind of boutique lecture at the end, uh, then I will be able to explain to you how it actually does the search in order to be able to find these sequences and like understand what's, what's truly going on in this video. Questions? Yeah. So the, specifically for this task, um, and this gets into to a little bit about task and motion planning, it's defined as a, a fluent where the bottle, the, the lid is off of the bottle. Um, and uh, we constrain it such as the way that you cannot take the lid off the bottle until you have exerted this uh, forceful, what we call forceful operation, the like push twist operator. Um, and so it reasons through, okay, my goal, is that I wanna remove the lid. In order to remove the lid, I have to exert this forceful operation. Uh, you also have to fixture the bottle in place. Um, and it kind of reasons through what is the sequence of actions that I need to take, as well as what are the parameters of those actions in order to achieve it. So the planner is actually, like we walk through how you do this. The planner actually is the one deciding what is that D. It's the one computing all of that, um, in addition to the sequence of actions. Task and motion planning is really cool. Uh, if you want a boutique lecture on this, uh, please say so. Okay. <laughs> yeah, any other questions before we, uh, we're just about at the end of time. Sweet, thanks everyone. Uh, P set eight is out. Uh, eight involves hybrid position force control, so you'll be able to implement it